I'm Cynthia Ross Friedman. I'm a member of the Thompson Rivers University Faculty Association Human Rights Committee. And along with Dara Cook and myself and the whole committee, we're very, very pleased to present this event for you today. Uh, two quick uh, points I want to mention. Number one, there are exits to this room because we've obviously got a very full house uh, to the left above and below. I feel like an airline uh, person there and then up to the back there. And to my right as well, so there are four exits to this room. Just thought I'd be some safety there. I also want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Chequetmik Ulu. And thank you. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, the Dean of Science, Dr. Tom Dickinson. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, again, it's good to see such a, a full crowd of people that are friends and, and acquaintances and, and a lot of people that I don't know. And on behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome you all to our facility here. And we pride ourselves at this university at being a place for discussion and debate and the full consideration of, of topics. And our speaker today has described um, today's topic as the most controversial project in the history of the community. And so it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here today. And I had the great pleasure earlier this fall to uh, moderate a session that was put on by KGHM uh, as an information session. So I think it's fitting that we have a full round of uh, opportunity for finding out as much information about this project as possible and for the discussion of the different perspectives. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mel Rothenberger. Mel is a former editor of the Kamloops Daily News in BC, in Kamloops. He retired in 2012 and he's a past mayor, which is when I got to know him the best from 1999 to 2005. Currently, he continues to do um, perspective columns for both the Daily News and CBC Radio. Uh, Mel's been involved with a huge variety and diverse array of things in Kamloops. He served as the chair of the Kamloops School Board, the chair of the Thompson Nicola Film Commission, director of the Thompson Nicola Regional District, founder of the Kamloops and chair of the Kamloops Graffiti Task Force, Founder of the chair and chair of the Kamloops Air Services Committee, founder and chair of the Kamloops Task Force on the Sex Trade, director of the Kamloops Airport Society, and founder of the chair of Kamloops Tangali Friendships Committee. So, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mel to come and give a presentation, give his presentation today, entitled "Imagine a Town with No Mind." Thank you very much, uh, Tom and Cindy, and uh, thank you to the TRU Faculty Associate, uh, Association Human Rights Committee. Um, thank you particularly, all of you, for coming today. I understand this is an important day to football fans, so we are going to try to get you out of here in good time to, uh, to go for the kickoff. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I am a former mayor of Kamloops, and in view of recent events, I think it's important to clarify something with respect to that. Um, I do not smoke crack cocaine. <laughs> and I am not a crack cocaine addict. Furthermore, if you have seen a video, I couldn't really comment on it because uh, it might not exist. But if one does exist, then all I can say is, I'm so very, 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 very sorry. I'm also a retired newspaper editor, as Tom mentioned, and uh, in addition to being a former member of city council. So I got those two things, retired newspaper guy, former member of city council, it makes me think that I may, might be a perfect fit for Ajax. 
<laughs> you laugh, but I, I could get the call. <laughs> could go like, uh, hello. Hey, Mal, this is Eve. Hi, Eve, how's it going? Mal, uh, we hear you're out of work. Yeah, that's true. Mal, we just want to know, how much do you know about mining? Geez, Eve, I don't know anything. Perfect, Mal. When can you start? <laughs> there are actually a lot of things I don't know much about. Um, I, I'm not a, an engineer or a geologist or a sociologist or a scientist of any kind, not, a, not an economist. And actually, I amaze myself that I have so many opinions on so many things that I, I know so little about. So you can feel free to dis disregard anything I tell you today. There was a Daily News editorial uh, recently, and uh, you know it shows how well they know me at the Daily News. But I want to say that uh, nobody asked me to talk about Ajax today. Um, I was asked to come and talk by Derek and Cindy about something to do with cameras. And uh, so I thought, well, what if I talk about Ajax in the context of the city's vision for itself? So that's what I'm going to do. So just kind of regard today's discussion as an editorial with slides. Uh, but some excellent points were made in that editorial, and I want to come back to them a little bit later because I, I think uh, there might be some answers, an answer or two in there that can direct us in the, uh, in the days and months that we're moving forward in dealing with this very important project in our city and in our community. You know, I don't believe, I'm not a conspiracy kind of guy, I, I don't believe in demonizing people. I don't believe in fear-mongering. I don't believe KGHM is evil or that the people who work there are bad people. Not for a minute. And that certainly includes, by the way, Eve Lacasse and Robert Koopmans and John O'Fee. Uh, there has been some talk that it was just some giant PR move, but I can tell you, I know all three of them. I've worked with all of them. They are quality people, they know their stuff, and if I was going to hire somebody, I would be proud to hire any one of them. Was it good PR for KGHM Ajax? Yes, it was, but it was also smart business. I have nothing against uh, profit because, uh, you know, we all need to make money and capitalism works pretty well most of the time. Uh, I, I don't know whether people will move from town if Ajax goes through. Maybe some will. Uh, I, I don't know whether all the doctors will leave town. Well, maybe some will. Or, you know, will, will the grassland be destroyed? We know some will. Will there be dust and water and devalued property? And will it cause cancer? And will it blot out the sun? Um, will copper prices fall? Well, I think copper prices are kind of the business of KGHM, and we shouldn't worry too much about that. That's, that's going to be their problem. I do know for sure, I'm pretty sure anyway, that Ajax would or will provide very well-paying jobs, and that where there will be other spin-offs to the community. Every job at Ajax is going to create additional jobs in the community. So it, from an economic perspective, that's a good thing. And I think a lot of those people who would work for Ajax will probably be trained right here in Kamloops, right, right here at TRU. Uh, although it's a little bit uh, uncertain right now how many of those would be trained here. But I think certainly some of them and those who aren't are going to move into town and contribute to the economy. So I can't subscribe to the panic kind of approach to this the doom and gloom. But neither do I believe that if we don't get this mine, all our sons and daughters and grandchildren will have to move to Alberta to get jobs in the tar sands. I don't believe Kamloops will become a backwater. 
And it won't mean that we're suddenly anti-industry. I don't believe Ajax is our last hope for prosperity in Kamloops. And I don't think this, this giant open pit mine will make Kamloops the economic envy of Canada and become a big tourist attraction either. <laughs> and that we'll all go around listening for the next blast because it's the sound of money. So let's approach the issue from a position of some balance and some logic and with our emotions in the right place. I'm not sure really which comes first in the discussion because if we talk about our vision for Kamloops, we have to talk about Ajax. And on the other hand, if we talk about Ajax, we have to talk about our vision for Kamloops. I wrote those words on the slide back at the turn of the century when I was putting together a document called the Strategy for Kamloops. And, and I also said this uh, when I was asked to elaborate on it. I said that my vision of Kamloops is manifested in our city becoming the most livable city in the province and ultimately the country. Kamloops will fulfill its vision because it has everything necessary to do so. Now, back in the 60s, Pete Seeger recorded a song called Little Boxes that was quite popular. And at the time, it was meant to be a statement on conformity and the negatives of suburbia. I mean, we, we do need suburbs, however, and we need universities, and we need golf courses, and we need stabi stability and jobs, and all the things mentioned in the song. But I think today, I think, I think the song could be interpreted right now as, as a fear of the ordinary. And I think we want more than ordinary for Kamloops. We want this special place to stay special. When our son was just a little guy in the 90s, one of his favorite books was uh, written by Victoria Children's author Julie Lawson called A Morning to Polish and Keep. And I think we want Kamloops, borrowing from that, that title, we want Kamloops to be a place to polish and keep. Because there are two kinds of cities, those with mines and those without. And the biggest question in front of Kamloops today, very possibly the biggest question ever in front of Kamloops, is which one we want to be. I attended the excellent presentation here a couple of months ago by Dr. Rob Hood and Dr. John Hall about tourism and Ajax and whether the two are compatible. And they talked quite a bit about the term capital program. And, and some people do think calling ourselves Canada's tournament capital is too narrow. Uh, Josh Paget from CBC Radio and I, and now I've just gone blind, I can't see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's not me. We did a segment uh, earlier this month and, and Josh Kind of a cynical young guy said, well, tournament capital just mean, says to me that there's a bunch of teenagers coming to town party on the weekend. And I, I had disagreed with him because I think we do have a collective vision for Kamloops. And as imperfect and incomplete a slogan as Canada's tournament capital is, it's, it's very strong. It's very strong and it does a pretty good job of reflecting the vision. I mean, as we know, the Shuswap or Shaquepin people were here for thousands of years before Europeans showed up. Uh, they were living off the, the land and the, the lakes and the rivers, and then the fur traders came along, uh, one of them being my great-great-grandfather, uh, Donald McLean, who was in charge of Fort Kamloops. And if you'd asked him what his vision was for Kamloops at the time, for Fort Kamloops, he probably, probably would have said fur trading capital of New Caledonia. And then the, the gold seekers came along and some of them stayed and started cattle ranches and we became the cattle capital of British Columbia. And in 1895 we incorporated and now we were a real city. We had a coat of arms and a slogan and everything, health and wealth. Um, the sawmill burnt down and so we built Riverside Park and we were doing pretty good. We had businesses and churches and hospital and fire department and banks and clubs and all that kind of stuff and even a civic band and we had sports. We had hockey and baseball and cricket, lacrosse, rowing, tennis, horse racing, uh, cycling, all kinds of things and the Kamloops Musical and Athletic Club put up a new hall in the 100 block Victoria Street, maybe the first multi-purpose 
facility around. Kamloops was a tournament capital in the making. Boris Karloff slept here and Robert Service worked in, in the bank before he went off to the cremation of Sam McGee. And then the, the automa automobile came along. My mom used to tell me uh, about my grandfather, her father, Duncan's first automobile, one of the first ones in Kamloops. And he went and got the, the car from, it was a Chevrolet, Chevrolet Baby Grand. He went and picked it up from the from the salesman, and except they didn't have anywhere to drive it because the roads at that time, all, all the streets were meant for people and horses, and then the people and the horses just kind of muddled around in the mud and the dust, and, and uh, everybody had the same right of way, but cars were a different thing. So they drove the car out to MacArthur Island where there was a racetrack. Uh, no horses that day, so he drove, just drove his new Chevrolet Baby Grand around and around and around <laughs> on MacArthur Island, and that, that's, that was our introduction to cars. It certainly was for him. So we started building wooden sidewalks to keep things a little bit organized. And then uh, we, we had, a, we had pad paddle wheelers on the river and tracks beside the river and pretty soon another railway and uh, right down the middle of Victoria Street. How handy is that? <laughs> we were the hub city of BC. And we had a couple of world wars in Korea and Kamloops and North Kamloops amalgamated in 1973, I think it was, uh, Kamloops and Brocklehurst and Valley View and Dufferin and uh, uh, Rayleigh came along and, and so did uh, Westside and uh, we, we were all one big city and then they built the bypass and that's the history of Kamloops up to the 1960s and 70s in a couple of minutes. Then we entered our pulp mill phase. That kind of changed. Uh, some direction for us. Now I am not going to stand here and say that uh, the pulp mill has not been a great employer and a great corporate citizen because it has, although it's had some issues uh, dealing with the environment. But overall, it was good for the economy of Kamloops. Would we put it in the same place if we had to do it all over again? That close to town. I think that's maybe a question that uh, is legitimate to make. Then, then came along our Cami the fish phase, and that was actually a good one. <laughs> because we started thinking about who we really wanted to be. So we tried the Hub City and a lake a day for as long as you stay, and the heart of the West, and, and, and we, we held Cami Overlander days, and Spoolmac days, and the Overlander raft race, and they all kind of came and went. So we were trying stuff, but nowhere in the branding sessions, and I, I used to attend a lot of them, nowhere in the struggle for a vision of who we are and what we wanted to become, was there an image of a giant open pit mine you can see from outer space? That did not come up in the discussion. Nobody raised their hand and said, how about this? The one thing that did endure and has endured throughout the history of our community is our feeling of connection with our surroundings, with the land and, the, and our lakes and our rivers and grasslands and forests, and with that, a commitment to an active and healthy lifestyle. Now, lots of cities have water. In fact, most of them have water, and they have land, and they have air. But the magic is in how they're packaged. It's, it's the location of them. It's, it's how they're organized. And, and we have the river, the meeting of the waters, and, and Mount Paul is over there, and we see Strawberry Hill over there, and, and, and we see Kamloops Lake, uh, and we see uh, uh, the grasslands over there. And, and, and it's, the way it's put together is, is what makes this place special. In the 1980s, a light bulb went on. Tournaments were becoming a big deal, and our, a lot of our teams were going elsewhere to other cities to play and compete, and, and other cities were sending their teams here. So city council got to thinking, you know, if we, if we had a, a good program that we could develop and included marketing and a lot of volunteers and a little bit of financial support, tournaments would, would, could be more than just weekend fun. They could be a, a real economic driver. In other words, let's go back to what comes naturally to us and take a page from the Kamloops Musical and Athletic Club. So in 1985, the city declared itself the tournament capital of BC. It was official, actually, uh, 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 
minister from uh, provincial government came and, and signed a document said, yes, we are now the tournament capital of BC. See, because sports, facil sports facilities are for residents as well as visitors. Tournaments aren't just about sports either. They're about you know, all kinds of competition from board games to, to theater. And, and we were onto something, but it was just the start. In 1999, a new council was elected. Just maybe the best mayor and council there ever was in Congress. <laughs> I'm a little biased, but one day the, the new mayor was in his office and one of the new councillors named Dave Gracie was there and they were, they were talking and, and Dave and Gracie said, you know, why are we just the tournament capital of BC? Why don't we go big? Let's go for Canada at least. And the mayor said, that's not a bad idea, Dave. Let's work on that. So that's what we did. We became the tournament capital of Canada, just like that. And we copyrighted it just in case you know, anybody else wanted to get in on it. And, and they did, because they all started trying to copy us. But nobody can, can become the tournament capital, or as it's known now, Canada's tournament capital. But by giving ourselves this kind of lofty name, by going to the next level, we were making a promise that when you come here, you're going to be impressed because we are the best in Canada. So we had to do something about that. We needed, we needed better facilities. So the mayor was in his office one day, and a fellow named Sandy Watt came in from the Kamloops Community Society for Sports Excellence. And he said, you know, we, we need a field house. And I said, good, what's a field house? <laughs> so he said, it's, it's kind of a big kind of canvas thing and you can play soccer in it in winter. I said, that's not a bad idea. I said, what's it going to cost? He said, 10 million bucks. I said, really? That sounds kind of cheap. He said, but we won't even have to pay for it. We'll get money from the feds and from the province. And it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. Well, we did that. We took it to the people for $37.5 million, and they said, we want that so badly, we're giving you permission to borrow that money. But we also went, and out, went out and got about another 10 million from the feds and from, from Victoria. And we made sure that there was something in it for the North Shore as well as the South Shore, that, that there was some fairness to it. And we have more than 100 tournaments, we've had that ever since. Uh, that come here uh, and spend millions of dollars a year, but we also have those great facilities for our own residents. And we've done much more than that, of course. It's not just the tournament capital and about sports facilities, but it, because as a community we built a college and then we insisted that it become a university even though the provincial government didn't like the idea at first, but they came around and uh, decided that, yes, we should have a true university. We've got, we've got a great regional hospital that's going to be getting even better. We've got an airport with a runway and a terminal building keeping up with the growth in traffic. And, and we have those things because they're part of our vision. They're part of what we've settled on as the kind of Kamloops we want. Now, we've made some mistakes since uh, we incorporated in 1893. We were so excited about the automobile, about my granddad's Chevrolet baby grand, that we started building for cars instead of people. And we built suburbs instead of neighborhoods. But we can fix all that over time because we know, we know where we're heading and we know what we want to do. We proved through the McDonald Park Rehabilitation Project that we can take a mature neighborhood and bring it back. We put resources into it, municipal resources. We brought the people of the neighborhood in and we showed that by working together, we can rebuild the neighborhood and make it a walkable, livable neighborhood again. And that, that is a template that we can use elsewhere. I was in my office one day and Roger Barnsley came in to see me. And he said, we don't really, we see that you're about to allow 
a gas station to go in right across the McGill Road from us, and we've just got a bit of an issue with that. We don't see that as part of the vision for our university community that we see, because this university is going to keep growing, and it's going to keep becoming a bigger and bigger part and more important part of our community. And a gas station doesn't fit somehow. And so I and City Council said, you know, you're, you're right about that. You're right. That wasn't the place for a gas station. There are better things to, to do with that land because we need gas stations. But it matters where you put them. Just as it matters where mines go. But some say we need those jobs. If we don't get those jobs, we're finished. Really? We're doing that poorly? With the, with the finest sports and recreation facilities and the best tournament program in the country? Our art gallery and symphony orchestra and Western Canada Theatre and, and a hospital and university and our parks and shopping and community clubs and volunteerism is starting to sound like tourism calendars now, but we, we've got it. And we've got the climate. We've got what we need. What about this economy that's supposedly on its last breath? If you're to, to read that statement from Venture Canada, it doesn't sound too bad. And we're, we're a city that keeps on winning awards as a great place to invest. Home Builder Awards and, and Communities in Bloom and Chamber of Commerce wins awards and, and even uh, you know, our, our, our city's Public Works Department wins awards. A winery, a Kamloops winery won a silver award in a national contest not long ago. Who would ever have dreamed that we would have a, an, a national status winery in our city? And not only that, we've got a couple of them and, and likely more to come. And, and, a, and a budding craft apple cider industry. And people like Mike Miltimore building guitars of international reputation. And, and we were named the best interior city to invest in a couple of years ago and one of the top 10 micro cities of the future. And we've got all of the support for a great economy. And a, and a great environment here where people can come and invest. We've got, we've got home based businesses and the business associations and chamber, and we've got manufacturing and agriculture. We've got a, a, pretty, good, a pretty good collection of stuff. Now, by the way, back in 2000, we set up a task force to cut red tape and, and speed up development applications, and we did. So we, 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 we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do, and we know what we need to, where we need to get to do it. Now, if Ajax was in full, in full production, this is from the Venture Canada's website, uh, if Ajax was with us, it would show up somewhere towards the bottom of that screen as a major employer. It's not, a, it's not in the top four, Depending on how many jobs we end up at with Ajax, could, could make it into the top five, five at the high end, but likely it's you know, going to be somewhere down in the lower half of the screen. I would like an economist to stand here, where I'm standing, and tell me where we're going wrong. Why, if we don't get these 380 or 500 jobs or 450 jobs or whichever figure it is, these jobs, these very jobs, if we don't get them, why are we doomed as a community? Where is this community of ours going in the future with no mine? Well, let's look at that and see how we're doing. Well, I think we're going to work safely live productively and play joyfully, uh, as I clever worded, cleverly worded it a few years ago, we're, we're going to be getting a new performing arts theater. I'm confident of that. We will need a new city hall eventually, although it may not be on the immediate horizon. We may even need a public convention center. We'll have more public art and we'll get greener and greener. Bicycles and people will get along better. I, I foresee a day when bicycles and drivers will actually get along. That's, that's my dream. 
our tourism, high tech, manufacturing, agriculture, retail, small business, they'll all coexist with our existing resource base and go in new directions we haven't even thought of yet. Like the winery and so on. We've proven, we've proven that we can be whoever we want to be. We know where we're going. And I want to show you a video that we produced in the city of Kamloops back in 2000 four and five that shows, I still like it, it's not used anymore because it's a little bit outdated with the, um, uh, with the uh, video components of it, but it shows that we're more about tourism and I think it expresses pretty well how we feel collectively about our city. Columbia's time to shine, and Kamloops is the place in the sun, where a new kind of community is gaining momentum, where partnership and a shared vision are building a legacy of health, education, culture, and community, of the best BC has to offer in this place in the sun. A place where people come to grow because opportunities are endless, schools are first rate, homes are affordable, and life here is simply easier. A place where education begins early and the pursuit of knowledge never ends. With Canada's newest university offering the most innovative learning in the country and opening even more new doors to prosperity. A place where we remember the roads we have traveled and are now building what we need to move forward with an economy that is both strong and diverse yet respects the future of our people, our water and our resources where new companies and partners are always welcomed and our focus on the customer is good for business. A place where living well is set in motion by a community that embraces active living and is healthier for it where people come to play because our parks are inviting, our hills are inspiring, and our water is renewing. Where wellness starts at an early age, and adventure can be found in any place. A community where the ones in the race motivate others to get involved. Where volunteerism is more than a tradition, and our people give more than their time. Giving athletes the chance to be their best by celebrating individual victories and celebrating our collective vision of a community that will not only finish what we have started, we'll finish proud. A place where we are building on what we have and know exactly where we're going. It's a new dawn in Kamloops. It's our place in the sun. exactly where we're going. 
every time I see that video, it kind of tugs at me a little bit because I think it, it really speaks to, to our vision as a community. Oops, sorry. Uh, the, the public opinion polls are kind of interesting on this issue. Uh, there have been several of them, and uh, public opinion polls are not kind of maybe something that people put a lot of stock in after the last couple of provincial elections, <laughs> but uh, they are kind of interesting to look at anyway. And, and I'm, not, I'm not the best at making charts, but I did look at a couple of polls from KGHM uh, that they did back in 2011-2012. Uh, we um, also had a, a poll done by, uh, by Roundabout Communications. We had one done by uh, the Kamloops Daily News, or commissioned by the Kamloops Daily News, and one uh, recently by the Kamloops Voter Society. Now these are done with different methodologies and different sample sizes, but all the sample sizes are solid. Uh, the results kind of leave some room for, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are different, let's face it. But if you look at that, if you were to draw a line straight through at the 50% mark, you would see that the median there is pretty close to half and half. So we are obviously a divided community. But uh, I'll get back to those, those in, a, in a minute. The KVA or K KVS poll showed that most people thought the mine would have a negative impact on tourism. And it al also showed that it would have a negative effect on the tournament capital. But it's kind of interesting to look at the undecideds. There's this, uh, I think, kind of feeling out there that maybe there's this vast sea of undecided people who just can't make up their minds. But in any election, if you're heading into the last week, it's not uncommon to have about a 30% undecided among, among the voters. Uh, that's something I, I did learn about uh, polling for the paper over the years. And these polls together, if you look at the low end on the KGHM polls, um, I was told the other day uh, that the don't know or refused factor was about 2%. Now if you take that as an undecided, I don't know whether you can do that, but, but that's the low end. At the high end, it's 25%. That's not very high. That's that's not very many people who haven't uh, made up their minds or at least are, you know, who are ready to take a position. Um, so I think the silent majority is maybe a bit, a bit of a myth. I think, I think people are talking to their neighbors and they're talking in the community and they've got a lot to say about it. At, at a time when there's all kinds of, of angst over, um, you know, over, disengagement and low voter turnout and so on, Ajax, I think, is a clear exception. Um, people, people seem pretty engaged. They're ready to take a position because it isn't just about dust and noise and air and water. Either we believe in these particular jobs or we believe in the vision. Now, as much as I respect uh, Mayor Millibar, um, I, I kind of have to disagree with him a bit. Uh, that just saying it's too close doesn't cut it. I, I agree with the coach. Location, location, location. And I particularly agree with this fellow. We need to decide what we're going to be. And I think we've decided, but we're, we're at a crossroads here. And are we going to change directions? Or are we going to keep on the path that is proving successful to us? up until now. Uh, you could say, well, we can have it all. We can, we can keep all the great stuff we have and get a mine too, and there'll be more people to pay for things. Well, yeah, yeah, it's the cost of doing business, I guess, and certainly it's a choice. Some, some well-paying jobs for 23 years and some known and as yet unknown damage to the environment and wildlife and questions about health, well-being, and quality of life. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the choice, uh, but proximity matters because the closer it is, the more the mine will be part of us and the tougher it is to balance off those economic and environmental interests. 
The question was asked by the city, what about our quality of life? It was asked to Ajax. The answer was that. Now, does, any, <laughs> does anybody think that might be a little too late? <laughs> if Ajax built the very best open pit mine in the world and mitigated to its heart's content, it would still be ugly in the morning, let's face it. And it would still be in our front yard because KGHM International doesn't have any say in where the ore is. But surely we should have a say in whether every ton of ore must be mined and whether every job, every job is the right one. I want to go back to the editorial for a minute that I, I started with early on. Because the editorial from the Canvas Daily News last October 1st is absolutely right that we are a city deeply, even bitterly divided. In fact, it may be that impartiality is now impossible, that we're past the point of no return. But the editorial makes an excellent point about us needing a way to compare the two sides of the argument. Because some people don't like town hall meetings. Some don't like open houses, and some don't like one-sided presentations, like this one. So let's get the two sides together and let's debate like civil human beings. And there are many things that the, the studies can answer that the company's application will be helpful with as far as understanding this thing, but contrary to KGHM International and its let's all just be patient approach, there's a whole lot we can be talking about right now. We don't have to wait for that. We aren't jumping the gun. We don't have to be patient because this is our community. And we need more say in the agenda. And we can, that, it, that can only be effective if both proponents and opponents are on the same stage. And I would, I would issue this challenge. Let's get the pro-open pit on one side and the anti-open pit side on the, on the other and, and get a good big room, teams of maybe three apiece, could get the mums, physicians, and, and, and cap it together on one side and, and, and form a team. And, and, and KGHM could pick a team and, and we could have t-shirts if they want. Seriously, a neutral moderator agreeable to both sides, a proper debate format, and then we can talk about whether it works or not. And does it fit our vision? Whether it's too close, too big, too ugly, too much. We can talk about those things. We can debate the economic benefits versus the environmental impact. But let's talk about Kamloops lifestyle and quality of life and why we love this place so much. We can talk about the, the everyday feel of the community and what we want to see and feel and hear around us for the next 23 years and beyond. Because we are open for business in Kamloops. We're also Canada's tournament capital center. We, uh, we are a cultural center and a high tax, uh, uh, a high tech center. Some would say high tax, but <laughs> I, sorry. <laughs> we're, we're proudly a university town and we're playtime redefined and we're making Kamloops shine here in the Wild West and, and we're so much more than that. All these things are fundamental to our vision and we, we can't possibly capture it in a three word slogan, but we all know what it means. It's a strong vision, but it's not strong enough to overcome being labeled as a mining town. An open pit mine on our doorstep is contrary to the core of the collective vision that has developed and grown and formed over the entire history of our community. If Ajax moves in, for better or worse, we'll be known as a mining town. Now, I can imagine a Kamloops with no mine. 
What I can't imagine is a cow moves with one. Thank you. We have an opportunity, we always agree to answer questions, and that what we thought as a reasonable way to do it would be to have one microphone in this aisle, another microphone in this aisle. I'm going to turn this off because I've got okay. a big enough okay. voice, I don't need one. And that what I'll do is I'll keep a speaker's list and moderate it for, uh, for Mel so that he doesn't have to uh, make choices. He can focus on you and answer your questions. So is somebody Check, Jenny, got a Benjamin. that they'd like to address for us? No. Benjamin's here for the other. So Ben, you work this aisle and Cindy will work this aisle. Okay. Somebody want to uh, have a question for Mel? Oh, yes, Ronald. She's got a pretty good voice too, so I don't think. Um, yes. Um, what I'm wondering is, I actually share your vision for Calgary, so I'm a long-term resident here myself, but it seems that it ultimately it's a provincial government decision, aside from perhaps like city council could enact some nuisances bylaws uh, governing noise and, and dust and, and vibration, but really it's a, a provincial decision, so how do you, what if the province doesn't share our vision. I mean, what, what if there was even more than 50%, it was a clear majority of, of people in the, in the community that, that agree that maybe we should um, work to preserve the, the, value and, and the values and value that we have here now? What, you know? Well, if you're a, if you're a member of something called Aboriginal Cogen, uh, which I was on one side and you were on the other, uh, that, that example shows that if people are committed to, uh, to the community in a certain way and, and don't want something in their community uh, because they feel it's bad for it, then there is power in that. And I think there is a tremendous amount of power that is untapped. Uh, I, I think that if people uh, make it very, very clear that this is not for Kamloops, that that is going to be listened to by our politicians. That's one reason I feel that Kamloops City Council really shouldn't be so afraid about taking a stand that they should... Yeah. I don't think it's enough for City Council to say that we don't have the final authority because obviously any City Council is, is particularly in a situation like this, is going to have a tremendous amount of influence and a, particularly if it's reflecting the wishes of the community. Yeah. And then, uh, then Frank next. There you go. Oh, sorry. I'll have to get that. Hold it upside down. I should stand on my head. You're good now. You're good. You're good. Um, I would like to congratulate. Uh, I would like to congratulate two people here. We're good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Mel Ruffenberger uh, on his quite brilliant. Uh, I think, synopsis of how many of us feel here today. Here, here. I, I, would also, I should mention uh, in passing, I happen to be a member of the Physicians Group and also CAPA, um, for better or for worse, as they say. But there is something I'd like to bring to people's attention, which I think you will be hearing of in the next year, meaning in the first half of next year, uh, and it's called, and I think it, I just want to take this opportunity for two minutes, a health impact assessment done. And for me, this was a foreign term. Uh, I have a friend, Claudette Kelly, and both of us have just recently finished, a couple of weeks ago, a university course from Montreal online uh, to explain to us what health impact assessment means. And what it is, is any 
big project, mining, resources, new subdivisions, Commonwealth Games, uh, in the past have been subjected worldwide to things called health impact assessments. It's not just health, it's everything. It's socioeconomics, it's how you form groups, it's how things are structured, it's done in an unbiased fashion uh, with communication to municipalities, to local groups, uh, to tourism, to all of the social determinants that Mel has mentioned. And I just want to make you aware that when you read about health impact assessment in the next, in the new year, don't think this is just physicians and health. This is the total community. And what we're going to be trying to do uh, when we get up, we're, we're working on this, we've just begun working on this, we did this course, and the only reason I mention this is to give it a little validity. Uh, it was put on uh, by the people in Quebec, and the course is recognized uh, as, a, as university credits from the University of Montreal. So it's a valid course, and it tells you how to discuss, to get everybody together on both sides of the table, or all around the table, and we're going to be working on that, because although it sounds like a good idea what you suggested, Mel, I don't think that's going to work without us working on the groups to tell them what we're trying to do. We're trying to be unbiased. We want to influence the decision. It's not a decision-making process. It has certain structured elements that have to be done appropriately, accurately, and in detail. And it doesn't involve standing on steps and demonstrating. I mean, that may be a part of it if people feel strongly, and obviously they do. But health impact assessment is going to be a thing that CAMLOOPS is going to be partaking of, and we're developing it during next year. I'll have fun. Frank? Hello, Mal. Thank you for that um, sometimes uh, humorous presentation. <coughs> much enjoyed. I'm Frank Dwyer, uh, a long-time resident of Kamloops. I was proud to learn the other day that uh, camp plan is under review. And I'm going to draw on Mal's experience as a former mayor. I say startled because I would imagine, and Mal might correct me, that something called the camp plan would be founded on a vision for our city. So, uh, and I was enlightened by your description of the rather inspiring vision we have for our city, and I share that, but I've never seen it expressed as you described it. So I wonder if in conjunction with your suggestion that it's time that um, our council and our administrators uh, revisit the plan and draw the citizens of Kamloops into the vision and have us all have a better idea of uh, the deep love we have for our city and how it can be best expressed for the future because I think that plans too often wind up in cabinets and in departments, and we should revisit it so we can all feel excited and express the kind of city we want to live in. Thank you. Uh, for, I'll, just, I'll just respond briefly if I, if I can. Uh, of course, city council and city government works off of a strategic plan and that, that council sets for it, and then, and then that flows into a corporate plan, but I, I know a cornerstone of that in our city fortunately is is public consultation and uh, taking into consideration uh, points of view around the community so I, I know our city council is committed to that and uh, has been for quite some time and uh, you know the town plan is, is fundamental to the, to the direction that we're going to take so I think I, I, I agree with you. Tony, do you have the next question? I probably don't mean to like uh, Cindy, I think I have a room without voice to get through. Um, Mel, your, your original premise uh, was that you think employment is going to be a big issue uh, in, in, uh, in with KGHM and in Camelot and so on. Yeah. And, and I have to take umbrage, I guess, at that. Uh, simply because this mine, uh, as, as we have seen it so far, um, it's one of the lowest grade ore bodies in North America. I mean, uh, it is going to be, and, and because it's so low grade, it is going to be uh, a, a tied to the international price of the metals it is recovering, that is copper. Um, it's, it's, it's shut down point, as I understand, uh, is going to be around $2.80 a pound for copper and around $1,200 for gold an ounce. If the international price of copper goes down below 280, this mine is going to shut down. They will not operate at a loss. 
And I think that takes the whole idea of long-term stable employment, except for a very, very few who may work for uh, um, the administration or uh, maintenance or something like that. I think that puts a lie to that, to that very concept of long-term stabilization. Because if copper drops down to $2.90, are they going to be satisfied with making two twenty cents a pound? I don't think so. If it goes back up, what's you know, copper now? Three. Seven, it's about three ten. Three ten. Three twenty something like that. So it doesn't have very far to go. Uh, I mean, and, and and so that means that the mine, quite frankly, is going to be a slave to that international price. And if it goes down, the mine shuts down. A couple of years later, copper comes back again. The mine opens up again. People who worked there before. So there's no long-term employment there. I can't take my kid and my new wife and buy a, and go and, and, and risk that in cabinets. I'd rather go work somewhere else. Yeah, and, and when I uh, made reference to, to the jobs versus the vision choice, uh, I, what, what you say is a legitimate area of interest. But when you talk to folks around town, the, the dividing point seem, seems to be, and, and, and following you know, comments and letters of the editor and, and the blogs and the websites and everything, it's about jobs. That's the big attraction to this thing. Uh, and and if, uh, you know, if we can get some jobs out of it, then that's as far as, as we see sometimes. Like it's, it's a very myopic kind of view of the issue. And so the, the only point I want to make is that yeah, that's that's the choice. Uh, you know, if you want to if you want to want to make the choice based on that, then let's examine that issue. And I think you raised a good point. Thank you very much for being here, Mel, and uh, a great presentation. I agree with you, and I think everybody did here that the city council has not most of city council anyhow has not taken a position, and they all seem afraid to even speak on it. So we have a lot of people in the community, leaders in Kappa, leaders in the moms group, leaders amongst the doctors group, etc., who are spokesmen. But these people don't have whatever the time, the wherewithal, and that to lobby. And would you agree that lobbying, when, when you say the politicians are, are going to be the ones making a lot of the decision, that maybe we should look at lobbying some of these politicians? And who should lobby them? Um, that, that's a, a, a good point and a good question. Uh, yeah, lo lobbying is very important and effective, and I, I think the mayor actually ha has made a, a good effort to try to, while staying somewhat neutral, as neutral as he can, is trying to carry what he sees as the concerns of the community to the senior levels of government, for example, on the issue of the review panel and so on, when he was recently in, in Ottawa talking to the environment minister. I, I think that's very important that he do that, and I, and I think he's doing uh, a pretty good job. If, if, uh, if, if you're going, I, I don't know if there's value in forming an umbrella group. I mean, I'm not here to advise as to how, how best to, to approach the matter, but uh, you're, you're right that lobbying is important. And by the way, I'm also a little bit uh, confused as to why re a referendum would be a major issue why there should be any concern about putting the question to the people of Kamloops in order to provide city council. Uh, and the reason I say that, that a referendum is not the perfect vehicle for everything, but it is a great vehicle when people are divided, when the city is divided, uh, the community is as divided as we seem to be, and there's no clear sense of, of where we're standing, or what kind of direction city council should be getting from us. So I, I think, uh, uh, contrary to some of the comments I've heard from within City Hall, I think a referendum uh, is nothing to fear. I'll ask for uh, Tina, and then maybe three more questions maximum. Thanks, Mel. You've got a, quite a crowd here today. I'd like to comment first on the referendum, since you just brought it up. I see it as be careful what you wish for. The mining company has vast buckets of money, and I believe that if we put this out to a referendum that they would stop at nothing, and the propaganda and the money flowing out into this community to buy votes would be overwhelming. And I don't believe that the 
the groups that are against this mine have the, uh, the money, first of all, to fight that. And so I think that people who get out to vote and don't, they kind of think, oh, well, what's the big deal? I'm sure the government will look after us. I guess I'm in favor. I read all that good stuff in the paper. And it would be catastrophic if we had a referendum and it came out in favor of that mine. It's not like the city can go up there and, and put out equal amounts of information against it. They would have to stay completely neutral. And so it would be up to these groups that have no money to try and fight this great big corporate giant. So for my money, I don't, uh, it's, the thought of a referendum scares me. But uh, a question for you, based on a comment that Bronwyn made, what do we do if the provincial government says, we'll take care of you, and of course this mine is you know, state of the art and you have nothing to worry about, we're going to put it in. And, you know, so what can little citizens of Kamloops do? Well, one thing I do know is that politicians count votes. So that every time we, we send a letter or we, you know, make a statement that they are paying attention. My question to you, Mel, today is what value do you see in basically marching in the streets? <laughs> Peacefully, I assume. Yeah. Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> is, is that a valid form of, uh, of activism? Yes, uh, and I congratulate you for marching in the streets from time to time. <laughs> what, you, what you need to do is get a few more counselors to march with you. <laughs> And by the way, I, I do accept your point, and it's, a, it's an excellent point about uh, reference. There, there is a risk there, that certainly there is a risk. Um, but it's certainly one way to uh, gauge our, our opinion. And I, 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 think, I think there are ways to handle a referendum fairly to make sure all uh, sides are heard properly. Turn the, there's a switch on the side, just turn it on. Just kiss that mic. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I'm Frank Wesley. I'm a long-time school teacher, now retired in the Kimbles District. I'm just wondering about this job situation. I hear jobs, 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 but overall, well, are we not talking about something like less than 1% of the total jobs in Kimbles? Uh, I think that's the number that, that I've heard, 1% one, one uh, or, or 1 in a little bit. But again, the, the numbers change a little bit because, of course, we started at 380 and then and we're up. Uh, the company seems to be saying 500 at the moment. I mean, understandably, it's a difficult thing to pin down exactly. Well, let, then, let's so be generous and call it 3% for Christ's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. is, is this uh, the jobs, jobs, jobs? That is, three percent of the jobs in Kamloops is worth wrecking everybody's health, or at least putting at risk everybody's health, and and changing the, the environment, changing our way of life here. My my answer to your question is no. <laughs> Thank you. My question has to do with the demographics uh, representation here, the age level, and the possibility of mines closing. And so two of the biggest employers you had on your list were two other mines, Highland Valley and New Gold. So if they shut down, what's the future for Kamloops if there's no going forward? Is it just going to be a little retirement community? Is that what we want? No. No, no it's not. Uh, and uh, I, I, if, if you go back to the 1980s when we were heavily, our economy was heavily based on, on the resource industries and uh, the, the recession of those years in the 1880s hit us particularly hard because of, of our reliance on resource industries. And we learned from that that we need to diversify our economy and we need to get into other areas and, and uh, not be so reliant on big employers. 
So we need to spread it around a little bit. And uh, again, I would like, I would love to hear from an economist on exactly that kind of question because I'm not an economist, uh, but I, I do know what the city's efforts have been over the past few decades, and I think we've come a long way from the years when we were basically overly reliant on, on those major employers. So yes, mines do have a, a certain lifespan, and, uh, and, and I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think that is an argument for having another mine, but the, the key part of the argument on this mine is not, not just that it's a mine, because we need mining. Mining jobs are good. They're, they're well-paying jobs. Uh, they're, you know, 98 to 100,000, I, I never made that much money. And I know a lot of people who've never made that, that much money from their paychecks. So mining jobs are, are great stuff, but it's where you put them and where the mine goes. That is the, the key issue with me personally. Other people put other issues with it as, as higher on their priority list. But to me, it's all about the kind of community we want to live in and to be part of in the future years. Well, Paul, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you for uh, having the guts. Uh, <laughs> Friendly crowd. And, uh, I, will, I will take your, uh, your challenge to have open and public debates, and I will, on behalf of the university, offer us as a forum so that we can have those debates in an open and, and uh, wholesome way. So thank you very much for your, uh, your help on this one. And, uh,